This video is gonna be a bit different. I'm not gonna be talking about my startup in Kenya. Instead, I wanna talk about laptops and kids, specifically one laptop for every kid. Wait, that's not very catchy. Did I get that wrong? One laptop per child. That's our name and our vision. We want to create educational opportunities for the world's poorest children by providing each and every one with a rugged, low-cost, low-power, connected laptop. One laptop per child is like what it sounds. It's giving laptops to kids all around the world. A cheap, rugged, robust laptop that's connected, has education material used for entertainment to really educate kids. Now, it may still sound a little odd to give kids laptops when they don't quite have access to healthcare, proper nutrition, good schooling, really any ba of the basic necessities. But who's going to argue with education? That is, if you equate a laptop to education. And that's a big if. And that's where I want to start. Who's behind this program? How did it start? Why did they get this idea of equating education with laptops? What evidence was there for it? Because after all, one laptop per child was able to get poor governments to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this program. And when us in the rich world push ideas on poor governments, we have a responsibility to do our due diligence and understand what we're actually advocating, don't we? My name is Nicholas Negroponte. I'm the founder of the MIT Media Lab, and more recently, I founded something called One Laptop Per Child. Nicholas Negroponte, like you said, founded the Media Lab and One Laptop Per Child. He's been an MIT professor since the late 60s and is very well accomplished in his field, a field that doesn't really seem to have anything to do with educating poor kids around the world. But I'm sure there's some experience there. Maybe there's something from his childhood that really helps him identify with what kids are going through in these poor countries. I came from a very privileged background. I was very lucky. Uh, my family was wealthy. Or maybe not. My father believed in one thing, and that was to give us all as much education as we wanted. And he said, if you go to MIT, to which I had been given early admissions, uh, I will pay for every year you're at MIT, in graduate or undergraduate, as much as you want, I will pay for an equal number of years for you to live in Paris. So not only was this guy wealthy enough to have his family fully pay for MIT, but as a bartering tool to get him to go to MIT, they say, we'll let you live in Paris for just as many years. Not exactly the type of guy who can identify with someone from Ethiopia who has to get pulled out of school because they need to go work on the farm. But he's obviously still a brilliant guy. So what was the driving force behind One Laptop Per Child? I'm sure, you know, he had some good reason behind starting this organization. Well, One Laptop Per Child is, is, is based on the theories of constructionism. A theory? You have a theory? Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I got a little carried away. I'm really just jealous you got to spend so much time in Paris for free. That sounds lovely. Tell me more. We didn't really teach thinking, we taught subjects, and that we went through school learning particular bodies of knowledge, but we never learned learning itself. And that was the, the real influence for one laptop per child. Getting kids to learn to learn. That sounds reasonable, because that's really teeing them up for the rest of life, because it's not all about just learning in the classroom, it's learning on the fly, learning just in life. Well, that's awesome. But where do the laptops come in? What, what's the deal with that? Seymour Papert, who was also at MIT, and Seymour made an observation in 1968 that was very simple, but very profound, and that is that if a child writes a computer program, that child is engaged in the closest approximation we can come to thinking about thinking. Oh, he lost me again. Now, I can't even imagine the types of kids that were programming in the 60s, but it reveals a more fundamental flaw with one laptop per child. And it's that, that he's focusing on a single kernel of truth and then generalizing about the whole population, saying this worked for this group of kids, now it should be done for everyone. That's where it goes wrong. Kids don't program enough, and boy, if there's anything I hope this brings back, it's programming to kids. Okay, so it seems a bit flawed in the foundation, but what about the execution? Like, how are you implementing this program? How are you working with teachers, with the schools to get this going? In the case of a teacher, what we have to do, and we, whether it's one laptop per child as an organization or the in-country parent of the project, is give the teacher enough preparation to have self-confidence enough to let the child show them how to use it. What? Give the teachers enough self-confidence so that the kids can teach them? What's going on here? You're just gonna drop off the laptops and then, hey, there you go? A lot of people told me at the beginning of this project 
that, you know, you can't just give a kid a laptop and walk away. Yeah, that's actually just what, what I said. Well, you know, you sort of can. Actually, you really can. It's quite amazing. No, what's amazing here is how someone so smart can be so incredibly naive. And how is it someone who's a professor been teaching his whole life that values teachers so little? Obviously, some guided experience is going to, you know, benefit everybody. And oh, so teachers are valuable now? You just said they're irrelevant. The teachers are very often apprehensive. No wonder they're apprehensive. You just said they lack self-confidence to realize that these kids know more than they do. And then very quickly realize that this is the best teaching they've ever done in their life. This guy is saying everything, but also nothing at the same time. But I want to walk it back a little bit. One of the main reasons why they don't value teachers and they want to just drop off laptops is that training is incredibly expensive. And development is one of the most expensive pieces of any program. And therefore, to keep the price of the laptops low, they just get rid of it completely. And so he seems to be dancing around the answer because he knows his answer sucks. But let's get poor countries to commit hundreds of million dollars to this program anyway, right? Educate the kids. Not just a hundred dollars, it's gonna go lower. We promise governments that it'll float lower and lower and lower. This is Negroponte with Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the UN at the time. The price of these laptops is important because Negroponte is not looking to use his own money or get donations for these laptops. My mission is the global side of it to get the countries to do this either with foreign assistance or directly with, uh, with their own budget. These laptops were supposed to cost $100, but the truth is it never got close to that price. In the initial stages, the laptop cost about $188 for the participating countries. There was no logical basis to pick $100 other than the fact that it sounds nice. Hmm, <laughs> that does sound good. Which made it hard when, spoiler alert, things didn't work out too well because the program cost a lot more than I initially thought it would and the results were lackluster. But let's, let's bring in another voice. Wikipedia was supposed to be a partner with One Laptop Per Child, so let's, let's talk to them. Jimmy Wells, what do you say? I love the idea. Uh, they're really great people who are working on it, but I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic, actually, of the One Laptop uh, Per Child project. And I get that from my experiences, uh, you know, in talking to educators in the developing world. Finally, someone actually talked to these people in these countries. Um, I visited schools in India where the, the tuition uh, for a kindergartner is about uh, two U.S. dollars a month. At two dollars a month, you can get a lot of months of kindergarten, uh, a live teacher, real hands-on day-to-day instruction for the price of that laptop. And the project went on for better part of a decade, so what was the evidence that they were seeing to keep it going? The most compelling piece of evidence that I have found that this program is working is that everywhere we go, truancy drops to zero. There's no real evidence supporting that. Best we can tell, all of those kids are in school today. Still today, eight years, nine years later. Best you can tell, it's been pretty clear you have no ground game in these countries. You just want to drop off the laptops and leave. There is a belief that children drop out of school because they're needed by their families to work or the little girls are needed to take care of younger siblings. Well, that's sort of true. Turns out that's not really true. Oh, really? So what's your great theory, Mr. MIT? Kids drop out of school mostly because school is boring. <sighs> boring? I mean, yes, school is boring. When I was living and working in Uganda, the women pleading for advances and loans so they could keep their kids in school, it was actually because it was boring. But let's get into the actual evidence. In Peru, where over $150 million was spent on this program, this is what they found. No evidence is found of effects on test scores in math and language. There is some evidence, though inconclusive, about positive effects on general cognitive skills. Though despite what we ended up finding out in Peru, this is what Negroponte was saying. In Peru, as many as 50% of the kids, because they're in remote and rural villages in the case of Peru, are teaching their parents how to read and write. I don't want to call the guy a liar. I think again he's using that kernel of truth and generalize about the whole population, but you can decide for yourself. But then some of the more specific evidence that directly goes against what Negroponte's been pontificating for years. Evidence based on Uruguay, where over $200 million was spent on this program. And this comes from the Inter-American Development Bank. 
First, the evidence shows laptops use plummeted since their introduction in 2009. While in 2009, 41% of the students reported using laptops every or almost every day. By 2012, only 4.1% of students reported using the laptop all or most days, while almost 70% reported using it less than once during the week. In conclusion, the evidence shows that computers by themselves have no effect on learning and what really matters is the institutional environment that makes learning possible. The family, the teacher, the classroom, your peers. Lastly, the former president of the American Development Bank said, without a good teacher, there is no learning. It seems odd to be telling that to a professor at MIT. To close things up, I want to show a clip of someone who was mentioned in the very beginning. Seymour Papert. Our rationality is a force for the good. And the more people are capable of rational, critical thinking, the better the world will be. So that might seem like a rather benign statement. But the idea of having more rational people means that people are not being rational right now. And the fact that we're so smart and educated here in the West, for some reason that gives us license to have this assumption that we know the solutions that these people need. And that's how we can think of these solutions with no evidence and try to get people to put hundreds of millions of dollars behind them. We carry assumptions that we don't check because we're smart. And that's what I see with One Laptop Per Child. Someone who is very benevolent in, in his intentions, but was so incredibly naive in his assumptions. You know, people will just have to live with that.